Here we go. Hey, welcome to the Texas Legislative Update. I'm David Blackman, and with me is, as always, is Jason Modulin, the president of the Texas Alliance of Energy Producers. Jason, how are you doing today? I'm good, David. How are you? Just great. A little chilly, man. My uh, heater hadn't caught up to the cold up here today. Well, hopefully that natural gas is flowing and uh, uh, keeping you <laughs> nice and warm. It's it, it's keeping me warm down here in Austin. Yeah, unfortunately, we're stuck with propane in our neighborhood, even though we're smack in the middle of XTO's sweet spot in the Barnett Shale. We don't have a have a pipeline in into our neighborhood, so we're uh, these propane tanks are such a pain. But anyway, <laughs> and it's expensive too, man. I got to okay. tell you. It's it okay. has stayed expensive uh, despite natural gas prices falling. It's nice to have that that natural gas utility connection. That's for sure. Yeah, it really is. Well, let's let's uh, get started here. We uh, had a big week in Austin, a big night Thursday night with Governor Abbott giving his televised speech on his priority items, his emergency items for the ses session, and I think. Uh, you know, none of them were big surprises, and uh, but one omission was. And so uh, talk about uh, the things he's listing as his uh, emergency items for the session. Well, you're absolutely right. The state of the state occurred yesterday. Uh, it, it did not, in fact, uh, take place in Austin. Uh, uh, now for the past uh, two sessions, the, the governor has been on the road um, uh, in 2021. It was in Lockhart, uh, uh, kind of due to COVID restrictions and the inability to get uh, uh, several hundred people crammed into a tight spot at the Capitol. Uh, Plus, he, he could... just wanted some of that good barbecue there, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> They, they kind of continued that tradition. They were they were on the road again last night. Um, uh, many thought San Marcos, uh, he might be going to Texas State. He might be at the uh, School Safety Center, which is kind of a nationally known uh, safety center to help harden schools and, and really teach uh, uh, teachers and faculty about how to how to have a, a safe operating school. Uh, he was at a, a rare earth um, batteries uh, facility, rare earth metals facility, um, and really talking about direct competition with China and how um, Texas and really the United States need, needs to step up in that space, uh, yeah. not only on the defense side, but also on the economic side, how we can really uh, unlock some of these uh, uh, new technologies. But uh um, we've got lots of environmental restrictions and, and, and bureaucracy that really is is in the way, um, uh, impeding some of those things. So uh, he did name seven emergency items, um, uh, cutting property t taxes, I think uh, a big one for, for everybody, um, uh, as we all see our bills um, here at the at the start of the year, uh, ending COVID restrictions, um, expanding school choice, uh, making schools safer, uh, ending revolving door bail policies, and uh, and then two more securing the state's border with Mexico and cracking down on fentanyl. So, um, all, all pretty important items. Yeah. Uh, what was the one you were you you were thinking about that you were waiting? Well, on? you know, I there seems to be a little surprise that he didn't include more. Uh, measures to reform the grid uh, and how it functions. But uh, I, as you and I speculated last week, uh, because it has performed pretty admirably here this winter, uh, after doing the same last summer, I guess the feeling of, of the need for aggressive, additional aggressive action is kind of tailing away now, as tends to happen in the legislature. It, yes. Um, uh, it, it, coincidentally enough, uh, the, the Senate Business and Commerce Committee was meeting yesterday and, and kind of the uh, the start of the of the hearing was really what would you do if you started from square one? Um, yeah. And so you, you may remember uh, uh, former chairwoman Becky Klein, uh, the mm -hmm. Public Utility Commission. She really gave uh, really some outstanding testimony for, for quite a while, several hours on um, here here was the thought when we did deregulation and how we were going to attract uh, additional investment to this market. It's been overwhelmingly successful uh, attracting that investment. Um, and yet we're getting just the sheer number of people moving to the state right, and the growth, some of these yeah. older facilities. Uh, how do we keep up? And so that was really the governor's 
thought process too is well even if uh i'm only on a four-year timeline thinking next term next term next term type thing uh it still takes two and a half to three years to build a big plant a gas plant a a coal plant or or a nuclear facility uh just in terms of construction i know nuclear takes a long time more than that (laughs) yes Um, it does (laughs) But so how do you think about the 40 years, uh, uh, Texas, in the next 40 years um, and, and not just uh, right around the corner? So um, uh, but business and commerce yesterday was what would you do if you started from square one? Don't quite take the PCM, but uh, uh, maybe consider some some alternatives. Well, uh, you know, so I again, I it, it just is surprising to me, given his inaugural speech, right, in which he went out of his way to kind of emphasize the, the, what you just said, to, to, to make the grid ready and keep it uh, growing as it needs to grow and evolve for 40 years. And, you know, I think it's apparent that there's still some work to do in that regard legislatively. And so I just was a little surprised that it wasn't one of his emergency items, but uh, that doesn't mean it won't be addressed, obviously. Well, that's right. And, and and as you know, the lieutenant governor has has repeatedly said uh, this is a top priority for him. He, he rolled out his list of uh, his top 30 uh, bills earlier in the week. And so that that was really uh, his marker to say, yeah. I'm going to take uh, bills one through 30 and these are going to be my top priorities. Um, and and over the years, he has been overwhelmingly successful uh, at, at moving those bills, not only <laughs> yes. um, uh, <laughs> with his with uh, Republican caucus uh, members, but but usually in, in pretty bipartisan fashion um, in the Senate, getting senators uh, on both sides of the aisle to, to agree and, and support those uh, efforts. And I mean, number six, I'm looking at it now, is adding new natural gas plants to the to the state's uh, grid. And then number seven, which is what it was last session as well, is continuing to improve the Texas grid. So uh, uh, certainly top 10 priorities of which uh, two of them are, are in there. I'm glad you said that about, about the Lieutenant Governor, Patrick. Um, I I I'm it's uh, and I understand why, because he, you know, he was a controversial figure. He had been a long time radio talk show host. He said a lot of bombastic things on his radio station that he frankly owned, I think, over the years before he was elected. And it's it's a image of being controversial that is stuck with him. But he really has been a very effective lieutenant governor, hasn't he? Extremely effective, Lieutenant yeah. Governor. I mean, um, uh, really, when you're you're thinking back and and the modern era of uh, Bob Bullock or or or, or uh, Hobby, um, uh, he he has been far more effective uh, in, yeah. in in really uh, getting policy passed, getting big policies passed. Um, uh, sometimes working uh, uh, in uh, in conflict with the House. Uh, and, and sometimes right there uh, with them um, uh, in getting big things to the governor's desk. And so, um, yeah, he, he's been a key part. Obviously, he and, and Governor Abbott came in at the same time and has been a key part uh, of the governor's success is really somebody who has has grown into uh, a very astute legislator and able to move uh, through the process uh, uh, pretty deftly. Yeah, I, I he doesn't get enough credit for it, and uh, so I, I just responded to that when you brought that up. I I realized you and I had never really talked about that either, and uh, it it you know he, he focuses. I think he irritates some people because he focuses a lot on social kinds of issues uh, more than say a David Dewhurst used to, um, and and of course those are controversial issues that. Uh, always gets him on the wrong side of the news media in Austin. So uh, I understand why it happens, but uh, he really has been effective and uh, and good for him. And it's been good for the state as well. Well, and 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 you're absolutely right. The, the media focus is usually on the governor or the president yeah. um, and, and they lose sight of um, uh, really who, who are, who are packing the lunch and, uh, and doing the work. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and he's absolutely right in the middle of the middle of things. 
So um, let's see here. What else? Uh, P P U C. The P U C is up for sunset in this session, and uh, there was some news about that. The the commission has uh, recommended a beefed up budget for the P U C going forward. Um, I you know I guess that's fine. You know as long as it's not wasteful. Uh, but uh, I guess also, you know, you got five commissioners instead of three now, so you, you at least have to have uh, a bigger administrative budget to, to pay for, for them and their staff. Uh, but, but what else is that going to target in, in terms of the PUC? Absolutely. So uh, really, it, it, it's two parts. Uh, one, in the last session, uh, they did not uh, ask for an increase uh, while taking on uh, a substantial number of new duties. So uh, uh, the weatherization components of yeah. auditing uh, power plants to make sure that they are weatherized, uh, really uh, adding in the in the legal services realm, the ability to uh, hold some of these gener generators accountable uh, should they um, not weatherize and, and have issues there and they need to levy fines. They also, uh, several years back, uh, were given authority over water utilities in the state. Uh, it kind of makes sense. The Public Utility Commission uh, would be in charge of um, your, your your phone bill, your electric bill, um, and, and your water bill. We'll, we'll keep uh, gas utilities over at the Railroad Commission. Um, but So they transferred those TCEQ duties uh, over to the Public Utility Commission, and really, the Public Utility Commission uh, ha has struggled to get their arms around the sheer number of water utilities that we have in this state yeah. uh, so that they can properly ensure that uh, rates are being set effectively. Um, uh, not to disparage uh, uh, the good folks at TCEQ, uh, but their primary focus was on safety, on making sure that that water was 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 clean and 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 drinkable, um, but but now that duty has stayed at the TCQ, and really the Public Utility Commission has has taken on rate making, uh, which is a good thing because ultimately that's going to make sure that uh, the services that the Texans are paying for is is a, a low cost or as low cost as as possible yeah. um, and that there's not additional costs kind of factored in uh, on those rates or, or simply rates that have been stuck at one particular rate for a long time and somebody's got a sweetheart deal and a homeowner's paying more than their fair share fair share so um they've taken on a lot of work um uh and as i mentioned last session senate bill seven they had to take on new duties as far as weatherization that really they weren't doing before they did not get a budget increase last session and so i think right rightfully uh the sunset commission said we, we've given them a lot of duties we really need to back that up with a with a, an increase in their budget uh to make sure that they're able to handle uh, their public communication duties that they're able to handle their regulatory duties. And so um, uh, it is uh, on paper, a big increase for the public utility commission, but, but certainly warranted um, and, and really great staff over there that have uh, <laughs> been bailing wire and duct tape to make yeah. it work over the, over the past two years. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's a lot like the railroad commission, you know, it's been perpetually under underfunded and, and it's tough to keep staff and, uh, you know, because the pay rates aren't great. And so, yeah, I, mean, I don't think anyone should begrudge a bigger budget since they're taking on new responsibilities, in addition to everything else that's been going on. I, right. I, I just want to say one thing to PUC Chairman Brad Jones. Oh, he said ERCOT. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, ERCOT. Yeah. That's right. I'm sorry, ERCOT Chairman Brad Jones said that the grid is much better off today than it was two years ago. And I think that's something that we ought to all acknowledge. It really is better off. And it's because of what the legislature did in 2021, right? In the wake that's right. of that big freeze. They didn't do everything that needed to be done, but they did a lot. And a lot of it had to do with the oil and gas industry. 
That, that's absolutely correct. I mean, uh, kind of three parts there. Uh, certainly the communications effort, they needed to do a better job communicating to the public. Yeah. They needed to do a better job communicating between the agencies and between the industries. Uh, the second part, the, the weatherization, really uh, getting in to uh, the requirements on generators, getting into the requirements on pipelines uh, and on processors. And then the third, which has really been kind of a key to the, the Railroad Commission's work, is to make sure that those producers, those pipelines uh, are not cut off from electricity uh, uh, by the generators. And so elevating uh, those uh, facilities that were uh, not able to be protected previously, uh, 2021 really exposed that they, in fact, do need to be uh, protected from electricity shut off. And so a um, uh, combination of uh, multiple agencies kind of working on this issue have, have really strengthened and, and made the grid considerably better. Yeah, and we saw the results of that in that, that pretty significant ice storm a couple of weeks ago. Um, we didn't see, you know, in the wake of, of URI, the media focus was on natural gas freezing up pipelines, compressors, et cetera. We didn't see a lot of news in that regard after that that most recent freeze event, did we? And I'm sure there were isolated incidents. Uh, because there's always going to be, but it was not any kind of a significant uh, impact to the grid this time. That That's right. That's right. Um, uh, uh, the generators are doing a much better job of purchasing firm fuel resources. Yeah. Um, uh, the commission has done a great job. The railroad commission has done a great job at really promoting uh, the amount of storage that we have in this state and, and encouraging uh, not only pipelines, but also generators to, to utilize some of that storage. And so, um, you know, we, we, we sometimes we'll talk about Europe and the levels of natural gas storage there and how that can be concerning. But we rarely talk about Texas. And so we should talk about Texas and making sure that we've got sufficient uh, reserves um, and, and where those are strategically located around the state so that so that generators and, and public utilities can tap into them and make sure that um, uh, they can get gas. Uh, should there be field interruptions uh, and field right. interruptions occur uh, when there is ice? If I can't get a, a multi-ton truck out on the road uh, for safety reasons, for environmental reasons, um, uh, I will have wells that will naturally close and shut in. Uh, they're designed to do that um, because we don't want them flowing to the surface, flowing uh, <laughs> right. oil all over the ground. Um, and so, uh, but that is a key part and that has nothing to do with electricity. That has everything to do with highways and safety. Um, and so it, it, it took a while to kind of um, uh, uh, help people understand those realities. And, and um, I, I think, um, Certainly legislators, regulators have done a much better job in that space. And and I think the media is starting to understand that as well. Yeah, yeah, I, I do too, actually. Um, so let's switch gears a little bit uh, and talk about one of, the, I swear, the most eye-crossingly boring subjects of my whole career, and that is the EPA Quad O regulations. <laughs> And uh, there was some activity related to that this week that I know you wanted to talk about. And I guess to start by just letting everybody know what Quad O actually stands for. Yeah, well, well uh, Quad O A and, <laughs> and, and B and then C uh, are, are provisions uh, in the Clean Air Act that allow for the EPA to regulate um uh, emissions and identify new emissions that they find problematic. Uh, as, as you know, the Clean Air Act kind of named uh, some some key uh, uh, pollutants that um, uh, Congress wanted EPA to take charge of and really start to, to reduce. Um, but then EPA can create a, a new regulation uh, to go after new emission sources, uh, new yeah. pollutants that they deem um uh, problematic to human health and the environment. And so uh, uh, probably 20 years ago now, it's been quite a while, the Bush administration uh, identified um, carbon dioxide a, a, as a pollutant um, and, and methane uh, occurred a few years later under, under President Obama. 
and really it's been a, a challenge to figure out how best to regulate uh, a methane as it's released into the environment. It is released naturally by <laughs> uh, in our lakes and streams and our wetlands and our forest, uh, uh, certainly all of our landfills and wastewater treatment facilities uh, release quite a bit of methane. Uh, our ag community uh, is is still the the largest uh, uh, producer of methane in the yeah. country. Um, but uh, you know, as we've said many a time, elections have consequences, and so um, uh, the oil and gas sector is the focus of the latest uh, EPA rulemaking on methane. Uh, there was a nice Valentine's Day gift that uh, EPA required uh, us to get our comments in on February 13th. So that was Monday of this week and uh, making sure that that really everyone in the country had the opportunity uh, to submit those comments. I know uh, uh, they, you were probably one of the, let me get the exact number here, 308,524 <laughs> people that submitted comments. Um uh, you know, I'm sure that that's uh, one uh, percent or so of the nation. Uh, uh, I need to go back and look at my figures, but um, uh, we all provided comments, and um, really, uh, it, I thought uh, uh, AXPC and API and, and IPAA did a fantastic job, kind of our our, our national oil and gas uh, associations. Uh, the alliance provided comments as well. Um, uh, and while we shared some of the, the technical concerns, liquids unloading, uh, some of the provisions that um, uh, would make it very difficult to have a safety flare, for example, and so we pointed those items out. We also had kind of a philosophical approach to our comments of saying uh, the assumptions and the benefits that EPA is deriving for this rule are entirely contingent on American production growing or staying flat. Uh, anything that would reduce American production, that would just result in overseas producers filling the gap, filling <laughs> filling the demand. Uh, um, we've got a hundred million barrel a day demand in the world. It's, it's projected uh, by everybody, even BP, uh, IEA, uh, all, all the folks that can sometimes be uh, 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 prognosticators for doom uh, or for lower oil uh, demand. Um, it's it's a growing demand. Um, and if American oil and gas is not there, you'll get it from Russia, you'll get it from Venezuela, you'll get it from Saudi Arabia. Um, and, and they have considerably lower uh, yeah. environmental standards and, and labor standards, frankly. And so we like to combine the two generally when we're, when we're commenting on things and say, um, uh, this is an opportunity for EPA uh, to look at what's being done uh, within the oil and gas sector. Emissions have been driven down. Uh, emissions have also been driven down in the power sector, thanks to fuel switching, getting away from coal and getting into natural gas. Natural gas has been a critical resource to enabling renewables. Um, if you have a wind turbine, the wind turbine stops blowing, you need a peaker plant in order to make everything work. Um, and so uh, we kind of wrap that all into a bow and we'll see uh, what EPA comes back with. Um, uh, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality and the Railroad Commission had had joint comments. Uh, several of the trade associations here in the state, I, I saw Texoga and the Permian Basin Petroleum Association had comments uh, along with ours. So, uh, you know, 308,000 people sending in their stuff on Monday afternoon. My goodness. And yeah, I'm sure the EPA will read each and every one of those comments and give them all <laughs> equal consideration. Uh, you know, that, uh, that's the letter of the law. I, I, I can't <laughs> that imagine what that the law they, says. Uh, yes. <laughs> I can't imagine that they're reading every single one. They probably lump and categorize us into a few <laughs> uh, uh, choice, choice responses. But um uh, from here, though, uh, uh, they will develop rules that apply directly to the states. So yeah. uh, uh, Quad O A and B uh, apply to uh, kind of EPA um, uh, governed states or federal lands. Mm -hmm. Um, and also uh, what the states will need to do to potentially comply when they uh, introduce their state implementation plan. Quad C deals directly with that. This is how you uh, uh, shall comply 
uh, with, with uh, federal regulations. Um, and that same group, uh, what we're told, is also working on the methane tax. So um, you, you may recall our, our friend Joe Manchin uh, uh, included <laughs> in the Inflation Reduction Act um, a methane tax, um, yeah. uh, which um, uh, it's going to take some time to implement, um, uh, but it's it's due next year. <laughs> so um, uh, the, they need it, it's once this rule is wrapped up, uh, they'll be kind of doing simultaneous duty on the state rules and on the tax rules at the same time. Uh, and so it'll be a busy kind of summer and fall to, to get those finalized. Oh, okay. Well, geez. Man. <laughs> uh, back to the legislature. I know we're getting into time of the session when the hearings are are being held and bills are kind of starting to move through the process. Have there been any notable hearings, uh, votes that might have taken place this past week? Uh, I, I would say that the, the Senate Finance Committee is really the one that's really kicked off things and and, and started in earnest. Uh, House Appropriations also had a few hearings this week uh, and really uh, uh, put in place their subcommittees, so where they're going to put members uh, and the focus there. Uh, I, I actually testified at a hearing on Monday in Senate Finance uh, on the Railroad Commission budget. Um, they'll take several hearings uh, in Senate Finance, um, all of the members hear each part of the bill. Um, and then in the House, they break it up into uh, uh, multiple subcommittees and they split out the budget. Um, and then they ultimately get back together uh, with each of the subcommittees uh, recommendations and, and and have kind of a couple closeout uh, hearings. So um, that's what's taking place now. Um, and, I, and I would suspect most of your substantive committees uh, will start either that last week of February or the first week of March, uh, really starting uh, with some organizational hearings uh, and then ultimately into bills. Uh, as we mentioned, the Business and Commerce Committee uh, uh, met yesterday, but they didn't have any bills before them. They were just simply uh, discussing Public Utility Commission and the performance credit mechanism. Yeah. Well, we're uh, almost 30 minutes in at this point. Anything <laughs> else you want to add? We should add this week uh, before we sign off. Uh, have a great trip, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk to each other uh, after you get back. Right. Yeah. And just so everybody knows, uh, I'm going to be out of the country here the next week. And uh, and so we won't have an episode next week, but we'll be back with you in two weeks. And uh, thank you, Jason. And thank everybody for joining us. I'm David Blackman signing off and we will talk to you then. <laughs>